Cryptocurrencies have had a nice run in 2021. Is this the end of the bull run or can we see more upside action? We're here to discuss valuations, Ethereum and altcoins with Jason Lau, COO of OKCoin. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Jason, we've spoken to uh, Hong Feng, CEO of OKCoin, several times before. So I, it's, it's good to have another member of OKCoin to talk about uh, uh, cryptos from a different perspective. We're going to start with Bitcoin today, the biggest cryptocurrency and its valuations, or what you think uh, of the valuations. As you know, Bitcoin has had a tremendous run up to its peak of over $60,000 this year. It's come down a little bit, and as we speak on Friday, actually, it's come down 10%. What do you think of the price move we've seen this year? And do you think that this is possibly the beginning of a correction phase, as some people might be calling for? Yeah, for Bitcoin, um, it, it really depends on your time horizon as an investor. Um, if you zoom out and you take a look at what Bitcoin has done price-wise over the past 12 months, maybe even a little bit longer, um, it's up uh, something like 10 times, right? Um, so it has come a long way already, and it's natural for Bitcoin to take a bit of a breather, have a little bit of a price correction here and there. That said, I don't believe that um, this is the beginning of a prolonged bear run or a, winter, a crypto winter or anything quite like that. I think the, the dynamics of the market structure around Bitcoin have changed quite significantly since 2017, the last bull run. Uh, when Bitcoin went up to 20,000. Um, mo most notably is if you, again, if you zoom out and you take a look at some of the participants that have entered the Bitcoin space, a lot of these participants uh, are, are some of the, the biggest financial institutions in the world, right? You have the, you have the likes of State Street, JP Morgan, BNY Mellon, Visa, PayPal. These are some of the largest organizations that have taken years to take a look at the technology, the trend and the adoption of Bitcoin and have gotten comfortable with it the, over the last six months. They're not um, committing company resources and putting themselves out there uh, if Bitcoin were to be a flash in the pan, uh, per, uh, so to say. Mm -hmm. So again, zooming out, I think Bitcoin is still undervalued. Um, you know, I, I know Hong has on, our, on your platform uh, yeah. mentioned the $100,000 valuation. Yeah which I think we're, we're getting closer and closer to. Yeah. Um, however, I think it's, it's always important to note that Bitcoin is still an emerging asset class and there is volatility involved. So 10% drops, I'm not phased. I think it's very normal. I remember she first said that to me in November, 2020, around November, yeah. I think at the time crypto, uh, Bitcoin was trading around 26 or $30,000. It had just breached its previous all-time high in 2017, right. and then I asked Han to come on the show, and uh, a lot of people, a lot of my personal friends, didn't believe that call. Actually, it's uh, like three times in a year, a bit outrageous. But we're getting closer, as you said. Now we did see a major, pretty significant pullback since last week. What do you think was the cause of this pullback? I think the the immediate cause of this pullback were two things. One is the excitement and interest in crypto ahead of Coinbase's listing. This is a big moment for crypto, really getting in front uh, of equity investors, global investors uh, everywhere, and sort of really validating crypto as a new um, space, right? A new industry, a new asset class. That's one. And then two, ahead of that listing, um, traders were just over leveraged and uh, a bit, um, you know, really, really gung-ho about that, that listing excitement. So over leverage and the, 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 the Coinbase listing were the, were the key reasons why. And, and as a result... Yeah, well, we have seen, uh, you're, you're right, in the fact that the, the time horizon for investors is important. Uh, and so long term, you could still be bullish. But short term, we have seen Bitcoin in, 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 in shorter term horizons correct by 50%, even 70% on some occasions in the past. Would you say that kind of volatility nor profile is still normal? Is that still possible right now? I would be very skeptical of the possibility of something, a drawdown as large as that uh, today. Mostly, again, back to sort of the market structure and the participants in the industry, uh, in, the, in the market today. Okay. Some of these large institutions are, you can kind of tell based on the price action, but some of them have actually been outspoken about them accumulating Bitcoin for their balance sheet, corporate balance sheets. Um, uh, I think Morgan Stanley launched a fund where investors can 
uh, invest directly, uh, sorry, into Bitcoin and get Bitcoin exposure. You can see these, um, these institutional types of buying behavior as supporting the market underneath. Um, when, when there is a dip, we do see on, both on our platform, but also broadly in the market, that these players come in to, to pick up Bitcoin on the cheap, basically. Yeah. Um, so, so that's my, 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 I don't think a, a large drawdown, like a 50% or 70% is, is likely. Before we move on to the second biggest coin, Ethereum, we're going to talk about uh, uh, another altcoin that has been popping up on news. Actually, I was, I was going on Google Trends uh, search results, and actually Dogecoin has been searched much, much, much more than Ethereum in the last couple of weeks. The search result differential was just huge. Um, yeah. Now, you know what happened with Dogecoin. I suspect that the, the reasons Dogecoin was pushed up, and then when it fell back down to, I think it's about 20 cents now today, which is about a 50% uh, drop from its highs last week. <laughs> I suspect the same drivers were not uh, present for Bitcoin, right? Those are different reasons for the price movements. Absolutely. Dogecoin uh, has been very popular recently because of, because of two things. One, um, the, it, it's obviously fun and people get around, get get really um, behind it and they they spread the, the message of, you know, this this coin with it's about a dog. It's it's just fun to talk about. So the, so the virality of Dogecoin has been very high. Secondly, yeah. the Wall Street Bets community on Reddit uh, also picked up interest in Dogecoin, which also drove a lot of interest, um, especially from retail traders into Dogecoin. This is a coin that institutions are, are not really touching. Obviously, and so you can expect to see larger swings. Okay. That said, Dogecoin over the past seven days is still positive uh, versus Bitcoin or Ethereum, like you've mentioned. So yeah. there is, uh, you know, it is it is still a uh, at least on a weekly basis a profitable profitable trade for some. All right, uh, let's talk about Ethereum now. Um, Ethereum has is uh, again very strong. Has had a very strong uh, run. In 2021, tell us about Ethereum's primary case, use case, and then we can move on to Ethereum 2.0 and any technological improvements that we may see down the line. Yeah, so Ethereum, the way I think about it, and it's not a perfect analogy, is you know if you think about Bitcoin as a store of value, as something akin to gold, um, Ethereum to me is something like oil, right? It's a it, it, very important asset, very um, uh, uh, critical. But what, what it's used for is to power the network. And the Ethereum network is designed to be a decentralized, uh, permissionless, unstoppable, uh, they call it a world computer, which means you know, anyone can deploy their applications, deploy their data, and run programs on top of, uh, we call these smart contracts, and run these on top of the Ethereum blockchain as long as you have Ethereum to pay for the, the gas. Right? The analogy, again, is, Everything that's built on top of Ethereum helps Ethereum uh, get value because more people need the Ethereum to power those applications. Um, and so when you look at the value of Ethereum, you have to look at the ecosystem. Is there a lot of developers developing cool new things on Ethereum? The answer is probably yes. Um, are there applications that people are using? And the answer probably is yes also, right? You look at uh, over the past six to 12 months, things like DeFi, decentralized finance, or things like NFTs most recently, a lot of these are built on top of Ethereum. The uh, use case of Ethereum as a network has certainly increased over the past 12 months, and that has driven a lot of the price increase of Ethereum as more and more developers and users need Ethereum to run their and power their smart contracts. I've been reading some counter arguments to holding Ethereum. So as you said, it's had a tremendous run, but some people think that, first of all, it might be in a bubble because of how far it's run up already compared to some other coins. And second, uh, transaction fees are too high, gas fees are too high. You know, it's just an expensive coin to invest in. What, how, what, am I just spreading FUD right now, or do I have, there, is, is there any validity to this claim, Jason? Um, so there, there is a little bit of validity to that. I think those are great counter arguments, but you know, Ethereum has been a victim of its own success. As more people use these decentralized applications, it drives up the demand for ETH and makes the running of these applications more expensive. That's the gas fee component. And so that has caused um, users to look at alternative smart contract platforms, uh, things like Avalanche, things like Stacks, other token layer one um, platforms 
that can also run applications like Ethereum, but are offering the, the much lower fees and, and much faster settlement. So um, th- this, is, this is perhaps a good counter argument, and it remains to be seen how this would played out. But the Ethereum camp is not uh, just resting and, and, and um, waiting for competitors to, to catch up. Right, there are things like Ethereum 2.0 that are coming up, and and upgrades to the network that are coming down the road that may decrease sort of the gas fees and increase scalability for the Ethereum network. Okay, I'm going to come back to uh, the store value um, argument you made earlier, and I, I I know what you're saying about Bitcoin skeptics, and I have personal friends of mine who are skeptics of the store of value argument would say that yes, it's true, there is a cap on the limit. Of Bitcoin, that's that's capped, but there is no cap on the number of altcoins you could create. That could drive capital away from Bitcoin. And as we've seen now, even the governments are partaking. Well, not exactly creating you know altcoins, but they're creating central bank backed digital currency CBDCs. We've seen the Chinese central bank do it. ECB has indicated interest. And now recently, uh, the Bank of England Britcoin is uh, popping up on, uh, on news headlines. What do you think of this? Is this going to drive capital away from Bitcoin? For central bank uh, created digital currencies, um, I don't think they are a competitor to Bitcoin at all. If you look at what Bitcoin is, scarce, permissionless, un- uh, uncensorable, it's, it's really quite different than what these central bank issued tokens are. Central bank issued tokens are by nature controlled by the central bank. I think that that's the most important distinction there is. And really they are, they are sort of digital, uh, maybe upgrades of the existing fiat uh, money that we have. So I, I, I find that hard to believe that they would be competing with Bitcoin. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, before we talk about regulation, let's just talk about Ethereum's upside potential and uh, what you think the price is, uh, where, where do you think the price could head? Without giving specific targets, um, how much upside room do we have left? It's already climbed up a lot since uh, 2021. And, uh, you know, like Hong said, Bitcoin could climb up to $100,000, which is, you know, another, another $50,000 or so from here. Uh, what about Ethereum? For Ethereum, one thing I like to look at is the ratio of price between Ethereum and Bitcoin. For over the past almost three years, it's hovered between a range of two to four um, percent. But recently, it's broken out from that range. It's, it's now uh, at 4.5 percent or so. Um, so what, what that means is Ethereum and perhaps its use cases are decoupling a bit from the Bitcoin story. It's trading almost within its own uh, narrative now. And I think that's important to watch. If it continues that trend, uh, I could certainly expect uh, Ethereum to rise vis- vis-a-vis Bitcoin even higher. Um, and that's what the, the, the charts are signaling, at least. So mm. uh, I think Ethereum does have potential here. Okay. Um, just on government regulation, there's been, I, I remember in Bitcoin's earlier years, there's been a lot of speculation that it could be used for illicit activities, illegal transactions, and to some extent it still is, but so is the U.S. dollar, let's be honest, right here, right now. Um, the, the, the worry here is that it could be shut down by the government. We've seen some interesting developments from the government um, right now, actually. In recent weeks, the CIA director, Michael Morell, who has been with the agency for 33 years, has actually said that um, the broad generalizations about the use of Bitcoin in illicit finance are overstated. And he says that blockchain analysis is highly effective in crime fighting. So not only is he saying that, no, the government is unlikely to shut this down because because it's not really being used that much for you know illegal finance, but actually it's a pretty good tool to fight illegal finance and cybersecurity risks. How do you how do you think this will change the investment landscape if governments start to adopt this attitude? I think uh, one, like you said, the 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 usage of Bitcoin and cryptos for illicit activity is a heavily overblown headline. It, it draws a lot of clicks. And, and I, I think uh, people that like to dismiss crypto latch onto that as, hey, it's only for criminals. But the reality, like you said, is uh, I think, I think the, uh, the chain analysis had a 
uh, report that came out earlier this year that said 0.3 or 0.4% of Bitcoin transactions were uh, involved with illicit finance versus the UN, which states that up to 5% of uh, fiat is actually related to money laundering and, and illicit activities. Um, just, just to put that in perspective, uh, that amounts to a $4 trillion dollar value of money laundering using US dollars and, and uh, regular government currencies. So that's, that's multiples of what uh, uh, is going on in the crypto space. And, and that's exactly right, right? The CIA director or ex-director highlights a key point, which is Bitcoin uh, and blockchain transactions are uh, transparent and on a open blockchain. So anyone can go in and take a look at what's going on. The, the, the expectation of privacy is a little bit different there. And so I, I think as governments understand that um, and as organizations understand that this, this angle of Bitcoin attack or, or FUD will, will dissipate. And it, it's in line with the trend of uh, broader adoption, broader embracing of Bitcoin. Well, with the broader adoption of Bitcoin as a major asset class for all investors, institutions and retailers, and perhaps even the governments now, do you expect more or less regulation? I think regulation is important to set fair and level playing grounds for, for companies. Uh, there are companies out there that do try to uh, engage in fraud um, and, and take users' funds, for example. Uh, I think we just read something in Turkey where a large um, company ran away with uh, users' crypto. And so regulation is important to make sure that the operators are, are, are you know, uh, doing, doing things right. Um, I, I, I think the level of regulation is going to be commensurate with the risks and um, activity in the crypto space. I don't think there's going to be more or less. I think we will eventually end up in a position where, uh, similar to maybe other fintechs and other technology companies, uh, that's where that's where crypto companies will end up. Okay. Finally, let's talk about altcoins. Uh, what can you tell us about the popularity of altcoins in the past year and a half? And in particular on OKCoin, OK which coins have been trending in terms of trading volume? Yeah, altcoins uh, has been a hot topic. I think we recently saw Bitcoin, Bitcoin's dominance fall below 50%, indicating that the rest of the market has Is taken up a larger share. Is that the first time it's ever happened? Not the first time, but it's been, it's the first in in quite a few years. Um, okay. So it it is it is um and many argue it's a flawed metric because like you mentioned uh, anyone can create all coins and how do you value them and things like that. But um, I think it is it is a, something to watch out for because the interest is um, as Bitcoin and Ethereum has risen uh, so much over the past twelve year uh, twelve months. Um, others are people are looking to rotate their capital and look for other opportunities. And so we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, other layer one smart contract platforms that have taken a lot of interest, especially as mm -hmm. ETH is, has been very congested. Um, and so on our platform, what we're seeing is Stacks. STX has been a very strong performer, um, doubling, uh, I, I guess, over the past month or so in price. And one of the reasons why is because it brings smart contract Ethereum-like uh, capabilities onto the Bitcoin network um, it, it's it's enabling the massive amount of capital that's locked into Bitcoin, uh, almost a trillion dollars worth, to be used for uh, DeFi and and decentralized applications. There's there's a lot of interest in building new use cases on Stacks to take advantage of that. So we're we're seeing a lot of interest there, and users today can uh, commit their Stacks to earn interest that is paid in Bitcoin up to around ten percent a year. Today, so that's that's a very popular use case right now already. And then, secondly, if you look at um, protocols like Avalanche, uh, Algorand, again, other smart contract platforms that are very popular as ETH alternatives, those are those are uh, hot. And then, lastly, I do want to mention um, some of the the uh, decentralized um, exchange um, app, uh, tokens out there too. Uniswap is a is a prime example as as the leader in that space. This is an application that has a governance token, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, that's available for trading. And and as those applications are picking up in usage, their token has also appreciated in value and interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before I let you go, Jason, I, I just want to ask you about how our viewers can learn more about blockchain. I've had 
a few personal friends of mine who have been showing a lot of interest lately because, uh, because of where the price has been going. And so they want to learn more and they're reading various things. How did you educate yourself? Tell us about your career background. We spoke offline. I know you have a pretty, pretty traditional finance background. Then you worked in a startup by yourself before you joined OKCoin. Between uh, working in banking and now, how did you educate yourself about blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies? I think, um, you know, for me personally, I was a little bit fortunate in that when I was working uh, at a startup here uh, in the Bay Area, in my off time, I did go to some of these Bitcoin meetups and get to meet some of the uh, um, people in the Bitcoin space early on. And so really, you know, Bitcoin, crypto, there's this interesting uh, intersection between finance and technology and so economics uh, that really, really piqued my interest. And so the meetups were, were great, but very quickly you, you, you look into connecting with these people online, right? On Twitter and on various other uh, social media platforms. And so that's where I did a lot of my learning. If you go to maybe not now, since there's so many resources out there, but back then you could go on Reddit, go on um, Bitcoin Talk, all these forums and just ask questions, um, digest what people are, are, are saying. And, and I, I think that's a very easy uh, and low sort of low effort way of engaging with the community and learning more. Um, today, though, I think, you know, sites like yourselves, uh, you guys have, have a great series of interviews and, and uh, speakers that have, have provided fantastic insight, but there's just so much resource available on the internet now. Um, mm -hmm. Large companies, if, if you're looking into the sort of Wall Street research angle, Goldman, Fidelity, they're all producing research reports in a, in a sort of financial uh, approach. If you like the technology angle, if you go to some of these technology forums, um, they're talking about and poking holes at uh, assumptions that people are making on the technology front. I think, and then if you go on Twitter, there's always like, you can just ask a question and see what people respond and, and uh, debate about. I think it's, it's, it's really up to you. Yeah, I know some schools have been uh, offering blockchain courses. Uh, Gary Gensler was teaching at MIT. I've been watching his open course stuff on YouTube actually. I'm wondering. I'm wondering if all schools, all business schools, should have blockchain as a curriculum. Do you think? Do you think that should happen, or do we should we leave it out for of the traditional finance world? Absolutely, they should, I, w w without a doubt. I think this is the this this is a generational change in sort of how we structure value transfer and finance uh, as we think about it going forward. Uh, much akin to how the internet led to a huge boom and and change in our lifestyles. Uh, I think blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin will do the same for uh, billions around the world. I think it's absolutely critical to learn about this and dabble and, and experiment yourself, whether it's investing or using some of these applications early on. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jason, for your thoughts and your update on the markets. I uh, appreciate it and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Don't forget to subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube.